Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, good evening. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Rob Bell, and you are watching Getting the Record Straight. This is the Black Rock and Soul edition where we talk with and get to know uh, artists and, and, um, in the community as well as across the country. I mean, we've talked to people. Uh, in fact, Black Ice was who's from Philly, but lives in, I want to say Holland now. And so wow. we've uh, talked to people from all over and I have a really exciting special guest um, who I will go into. She's really got, got quite a, quite an intro I'm going to get into. <laughs> Sister Trapita Trapita Mason is with me. She is the 2020, 2021 City of Philadelphia Poet Laureate. So uh, before I uh, let me get into her introduction, this is a true Renaissance woman who is going to be with us for the next um, 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, as I said, she's the um, uh, Poet Laureate, or had been uh, up until uh, December uh, here in Philadelphia. She's a recipient of a Pew Fellowship in Literature. Um, she's all, also the Leeway Transformation, uh, she's also received a Leeway Transformation Award, nominated for a 2016 Pushcart Prize. She is a Cave Canaan and Callaloo Fellow and a 2019 Aspen Words Emerging Writers Fellow. She's the author of a book called She Was Once Herself and uh, Mocha Melodies. So she's got at least two two uh, books published, and she's also released two music slash poetry projects, uh, one entitled Scat, and the other is This Is How We Get Through. Uh, Trapita is originally from Liberia, now residing here in Philadelphia in the Germantown uh, area. She's a graduate of Temple University, as am I. Uh, so she can't be bad. <laughs> she's, uh, from Bryn, uh, also attended Bryn Mawr uh, University's Graduate School of Social Work, and also Villanova University's Business School. So, uh, Trapita Mason, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Boy, I was like, is he going to read all of that? <laughs> you know, well, I, but thank you so much, Rob, for having me here. I'm honored. No, it's my pleasure. It really is. Um, you know, when I look over things, people's background, I, you know, I have to discern, you know, determine what should be kept in and what not. And um, mm. I haven't been wrong yet, though. I mean, everybody's been satisfied thus far. Yeah, so yeah. I no, hope I I've am done too. you justice. But... You've done me a great, <laughs> great justice. And um, just thank you. I mean, that's just, it's so nice when people take the time to, you know, try to just get you get your information out there so i appreciate it very much <laughs> it's a beautiful thing and philly is uh well first of all i don't know how many cities big cities anyway in the country have a poet laureate i mean i think it's a testimony to philly that indeed they have that because um I'm trying to think is it yolanda or uh, yes yolanda wisher um well the poet laureate uh started with, you know, we always say the forever poet laureate, uh, Sonia Sanchez, which is sure. probably about, mm, I don't know, what, about 10 years now, maybe mm. a little. Uh, so it hasn't been that many poet laureates, but um, yeah, Philly, uh, it is in some, you know, major cities and uh, there's also a statewide one. And as we also know, there's the country, you know, poet laureate. Sure. Uh, yeah. uh, um, Joy uh, Harjo, but right now, I mean, Philly, you do have to applaud them, and there's a small committee uh, currently who's really working to push that forward. Yolanda Wisha is kind of leading that committee, and a lot of it is just poets and writers and other folks just deciding that it's important to the city and working with the Free Library of Philadelphia to make sure we keep that tradition going. I, I think it's really important for our city. It's fantastic. Um... As I said, I mentioned that you um, were born in Liberia. Yes. Um, there's a lot of history between the United States and Liberia. Yes. If you could, you know, give us a thumbnail of 
you know, kind of that relation, uh, you know, some of that history of Liberia and then transition into your journey that, you know, got you here. And, um, um, and then finally along, you know, along with that, um, I would suspect, you know, this country, there's a lot of turmoil in so many areas, mm-hmm. not the least of which is immigration policy yes. and that kind of yes. thing. So if you could finish with maybe some thoughts and opinions, you know, uh, your outlook in terms of um, immigration and, and kind of how we ought to be maybe dealing with that, uh, you know, we've got the Haitian situation. And, yes, you know. yes. So let's start with Liberia and kind of move through that. Yeah, so Liberia, um, you're so right, um, Rob, and a lot of the history is interconnected with America. So Liberia is on the west coast of Africa and um, is part of that continent. But even the name Liberia is named, um, if based on the American word, and Monrovia, the capital, um, is uh, named after James Monroe. So that just kind of tells you the connection. But uh, when people think about colonialism and all the things that impacted the African continent, um, often they're not talking about Liberia as being essentially an Amer- colonized by the United States. Um, what happened is a number of, you know, and I consider, I, I left here, I got to America around eight years old and I grew up in North Philadelphia mostly in Germantown. And so I consider myself really a part of both of these, you know, amazing cultures, the the African diaspora culture in America and also in, you know, on the on the continent. And um, I think what you will find when our ancestors who went back to Liberia to settle, they were backed by the American government. And a story my father always tells me is, you know, post uh, slavery, a lot of people that um, you know, there was a, a lot of, you know, the, the I would say the enslavers, uh, those who kept others enslaved, that those individuals that had children and there was this thing of, you know, how do we get people back to the continent? So a number of individuals came on what was then um, parts of the original, you know, land indigenous to the people and settled there in very much the same fashion as what had happened with um, the indigenous people in America and the whites when they came. But a lot of people that went back were, you know, our descendants of, um, you know, enslaved folks. And they, a lot of them were really uh, children of these, you know, their former uh, enslaved, you know, their folk um, masters or whatever you want to call them. And they went back and kind of saw this land and there was all different ways that they were able to um, kind of take in this community, whether it was we'll buy land from you with trade or we will take it over by force. All of those things were done. And what happened with the history of Liberia, you had years of um, a disconnect, you know, and a two, two systems uh, that was supported in the large part by America. Uh, where you had those who had, who had come from America to resettle, kind of taking over the land and being sort of, for lack of a better word, in power, or um, and then those who were the indigenous people to the land were sort of servants um, to these individuals. So that went on for a number of years. Things are different now in Liberia, but you still have remnants of some of that. Um, it's a it's a tropical country. Um, what encourage my parents to immigrate to this side was what every immigrant is looking for. Opportunity, a different way of life, education, work, whatever. And I was young when I came here. So I I was really just entered into the system here and grew up through the uh, educational system, socially and everything, but still held on to the culture. And then in immigration today, um, you're right to kind of call that out. I write a lot about that in my poems. and share a lot about that because there's still, particularly when it comes to uh, immigration, as you mentioned, Haitian, African, um, there's just a whole different way. I mean, even from everything from getting a visa to being able to um, remain in a country, for, and it's just it's a lot more difficult. 
Um, and there's a lot more, I would say, political um, fire out here about people, all different things that people are thinking about immigration. But one of the things I noticed they associate immigration a lot with, um, you know, people coming from Spanish speaking countries or Mexico. And rarely do you hear about the whole African experience, or as you mentioned, the Haitian experience, or some of these other experiences that are not really known about out here in the culture. So that's just a long-winded way, but um, to say that you know we're all one people, um, we have to really understand the history and how that impacts us and where we are, and then fight for you know justice on some level because you know you'll see the difference in how people are treated. And even the former president said the same thing about the preference for, you know, who they want to kind of immigrate, who they want to come to America versus who are denied entrance um, here in a lot of ways. Yeah, I've actually wanted to do more. I haven't gotten around to its study of the Liberia and mm -hmm. the experience of, uh, you know, formerly enslaved people here who uh um emigrated i guess back uh, yes yeah and you know the challenges and that kind of thing of uh of coming back it's, it sounds you know it sounds like a movie i'd like to see yes me too <laughs> a couple of them you know yeah a couple of them um yes yeah that's uh uh really interesting um uh so, yeah, I was saying off camera, you know, when we first got started that you have a pretty broad uh, academic background, you know, mm -hmm. um, social work. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what was your undergraduate degree? Political science. Political, <laughs> uh, actually, my, yeah. my graduate degree is in uh, under political science at public wow. administration. So, okay. and then you've got a master, uh, um, a, a MBA, is it from Villanova too? Yes, yes. So yeah, how is totally. I, but there's no, <laughs> I don't see any coursework in poetry or creative no. writing. So how is no. that, how is the, 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 the academic stuff informed, you know, your writing and, and poetry and creative processes? Yeah, it's so funny. I've always leaned, I've always had uh, strong English, you know, um, grades, I guess, in school. And I've always loved English and reading. Uh, but no, I majored in political science. At some point, I thought about going on to, you know, law school when I was younger. Well, how does it kind of show up? Um, so I was a social worker for many, many years and then decided, hey, let me balance this out by getting some of those business skills and key business skills um, that I need. Um, my work, it, oh, it's informed by all of these experiences because let me tell you, with political science, I think, you know, undergrad, it really helps you kind of get that global perspective, right? To be able to write about these issues that's impacting the world. Social work all day, every day, I'm kind of, you know, engaging. I work in community mental health at an agency in Kensington. So it gives me a lot of time and opportunity to think about people and their lives and, um, and how that's, you know, what societal issues are impacting them. And then with the, with the business piece, one of the most important things I learned, I mean, in this world, it is such at times a world of haves and a haves and a have nots, and we're really part of a capitalistic system. And to be able to write about these things, it informs my writing in so many ways. Um, I don't write like directly about these things necessarily, but I know that the knowledge base or the experiences that I have because of it show up in my writing. So whether I'm writing about immigration or political issues or even just everyday people and their everyday experiences, all, all of those, I guess, other educational pieces of me kind of show up in there as well. So when did you make the move to actually, you know, start writing and publish and that kind of thing? Yeah, I have been writing since I was in the fifth grade. It's always something I've been loving to do. In high school, I... I added some pieces to the literary journal. You know, they were okay. They were kind of things we all start writing when we're young. You know, these sad poems and things which, like that. Which school, by the way? <laughs> I went to Little Flower, Little Flower Catholic High oh, School right. for girls. <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't tell me you went to North Catholic or something. No, no, no. I actually, I actually no. went to a prep school called Episcopal Academy. I've heard of Episcopal yeah. Academy. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I went 
to I went to a uh, little flower and then um, you know just started thinking it was at Temple where I did a stint one year at St. Joe's but I transferred to Temple and it was at Temple when I met this professor Danny Black and he was this wonderful African American teacher very high energy. And I took a like a, a writing class or a poetry class. I've only had one poetry class in, in terms of an academic institution. And Danny Black made us all do this poem. I think I had that class with Ursula Rucker. And he made us all do, yeah, well, she went to Temple as well. And Danny had us do this poem. And then he said he wanted all of us to come outside and to read in front of the student, you know, sax in an activity center back in the day. <laughs> And I just remember him saying, like, everybody's going to read it. And I just remember being so afraid. I think it might have been, like, the first time. Mm -hmm. But I wanted that A or that grade. And I think it might have been the first time. I think Danny's probably at Clark University now. Mm -hmm. So then I ended up taking this women's uh, writing class with Sister Sonia Sanchez, which everybody always wanted to take a class, you know, with her when she was on Temple's campus. And then from there, I just really started writing more, being serious about it. But I didn't call myself a poet. Probably I was in my late 20s, early 30s when I really started calling myself a poet. And then, you know, I part of Kavi Kanam, part of different workshops, engaging with other writers, helping to run a um, poetry series way back in the day called Panoramic Poetry. And then just kind of doing that. And the publications are self-published. Um, I started reading, I read about Nikki Giovanni and how at 25, I don't know if a lot of people know that she wrote her, her autobiography, and then she had an album, and she decided that she was going to um, do her own album release, and she just, like, did everything, and by the time it was time to release her album or her book or one of those things, there was a line around the block, so what that taught me was if those avenues are not open for you and those doors are not open for you, create it yourself. So at the time, I know I was one of, not the first, but one of the first poets in our general radar ge ge geography, geographical area that was self-published. And I really wanted to do this book. And I and I, I remember my net, we've been friends for a long time. She put a band together. We had um we uh, talked to the, uh, what is that? The African-American Museum. I was doing it in Nikki Giovanni style. <laughs> Advertised it, had a band, had people come. Yolanda Wisher read and some other folks read. And it was just this big old book party. And, um, and that book was self-published just based off of my wages as a social worker mm. um, to be able to do that. So a lot of the things that I had wanted to do, like, artistically, when those opportunities weren't available, I just created them myself or worked with other people and we created it, you know, together. That is so fantastic. Uh, <laughs> I, I, that experience, because I've, I've written a book, I wrote a book in 2007, I, and self-published and that, that whole thing. I, I, I didn't get a band, I, I don't, I, <laughs> even though the book's about music, interestingly yeah. enough, but Really? What's it called? It's called The Myth of Rock and Roll. Oh. I brought it up. Since I brought it up. Yeah. It's uh, The Myth of Rock and Roll, The Racial Politics of American Popular Music. Wow. Uh, and it did, uh, I won't say it did well, but, you know, for the kickoff and, you know, I had two book signings and it, it was a lot of fun, a lot of work. Yeah. A lot yeah. of work. That and, sounds like uh, a great read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know, but it, um, you know, it was a, 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 it was a heartfelt kind of thing, and mm -hmm. and I think that's that's really what's important. But um, um, yeah. So, you know, Philly is a, a bit of a haven, I think, for writers and and mm -hmm. uh, uh, poets in particular. Um, who are some of the people who you really? were influenced by, uh, you mentioned Nikki Giovanni. I remember when her album came out, you know, mm -hmm. that was a, a really great period of black arts movement period, the late sixties. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But who are some of the people that you read a lot? Uh, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Well, 
I've read definitely Sister Sonia Sanchez. And then later on in life, as I became, you know, older and adult and, and I lived across the street from her for a spell a little while in a little apartment across the street from her house. So I would visit and we would take little walks and um, call her from time to time, still do, and have these little conversations. Um, for me, she's, you know, a mentor, a writer, uh, a person that I really hold dear uh, in my heart. Other writers that I've really uh, adored um, are Lucille Clifton is one of them. Um, I follow her her work. She's you know deceased now, but I do follow her. Um, she's someone that I. The, the thing about her and her life, she was an underestimated writer um, for the early parts of her life. And, her, and who's, what's her name? Lu Lucille Clifton. Lucille she has Clifton. this great poem. Won't you celebrate with me? What I have shaped into a kind of life. Uh -huh. I don't know if you know that poem. I memorized. It's a very <laughs> short poem. But the thing about her is, she has, she will show you an entire world in her poems, and they were this the brevity. You know, these short pieces could do so much. And I discover her early on. You know, but I didn't. I didn't really pay a lot of attention to it as we sometimes do. And then later on in life, particularly with that poem, Won't You Celebrate With Me? And then just her life story. Um, she was, and, and one tidbit that I love to share about her now is when well, Lucille Clifton was um, a married woman, she and her husband ended up losing their family home in Baltimore. She's originally from Buffalo. But they ended up settling, having children in Baltimore, and they lost their family home to foreclosure. And in, in 2018, I want to say, uh, her daughter, who now works for that Jim Henson company, the public company, bought back the house. And she bought back the house. Now her mother's deceased, but they turned it into the Lucille Clifton Museum. And so there is a museum now. Um, and when we think about just her legacy, her work, there's so many writers, Rita Dog, um, Marie Howe. Um, I'm an avid reader of poetry. Um, so I, I, there are so many people. Um, in, in my contemporaries, you know, I enjoy a lot of our Philadelphia folks. I talk about Yolanda, you know, Ursula Rucker, Enzati uh, Keita. She has a new book out. Um, about to have a new book released. Um, so yeah, those those folks, there's lists and lists of them. Um, I could spend this whole show talking about all the different writers. Well, speaking of poetry, do you have a couple of things maybe you could share with us? Oh, yeah, I can. Um, yeah, so hmm, maybe I'll do Monuments to Brown Boys. Um, it's generally on my computer. So it's easier to read off my computer. Box. Just give me two seconds. Um, so yeah, this poem I ended up writing. Um, I, I wrote this poem um, care, uh, because there was a care, an artist, a visual artist named Karen Olivier, and she was she created this huge mirror. Uh, to cover a monument in Vernon Park here. And so they asked me to write a poem that's inspired by that, um, by that monument. When she put this mirror over this monument uh, in a largely African-American community, but you know, a lot of people would go by and say, well, why did they cover the monument? There were a lot of really upset people. But what she was trying to do is get the community to really be a part of that that monument, to be the monument, to see themselves in mm -hmm. it, and I thought it was really clever. So I ended up um, just writing a poem about that. Monuments to Brown Boys. Okay. Don't put my glasses on. Okay. The artists install the mirror over the monument and the people have come to gawk. Rubberneckers wonder what was there before. You have come to lying in the cut statue still for seconds, your reflection edging off a 20 foot high bronze looking glass. 
You are an alluring hunk of stone beguiling me. Yes, you, brown boy, monolith, rough, rough cut, I see you. You are a low slung, jean weary, grandmother greeting pillar, an obelisk marking the entrance, marking the entrance of your hood. You need to be somebody's memorial and not only when you laid out and lowered in the dirt, a cold slab, your footstone, your pillow, a marble headrest of past tense. He was, he once, he lived. No, you are now and present alive and in color. And you need to be somebody's walking shrine, somebody's testament, somebody's tribute in this city. You have to be carved, stretched and erect, a column to buttress the boogeyman, the phantoms they say you imagine, the specters and goblins who tow bullets and policies and laws that encase you. You need to be somebody's memento. Look how you beaming off that seeing glass. I'm catching your shine. Look at that swagger you carrying, hoodie wearing, fresh fade having, full teeth grinning. You need to be somebody something to fight for, somebody's celebration, somebody's stone turned monument, carved and smooth, somebody's masterpiece in this city. So that's Monuments to Brown. That is fantastic. Thank you. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate um, that. Anything uh, you have that speaks to the, uh, you know, issue with the, the pandemic and being shut up and. Oh, yeah, I have a poem uh, called We Will Make Something Out of This Too. Yeah, I think I heard that. Yeah. Is that on your yeah. website too, I think? Uh, it might be. I have to update my website. I think the video was on there, but I can mm. share that. Would you please? Um, Sure, we will make something out of this too. Mm -hmm. We are the builders, the creators, and the magicians of our lives. We are the designers and the inventors of our lives. And we will make something out of this too. We strain to understand this new language in our grave and weary lilt, in our haggard cadence. We mouth to one another stark words, distancing, isolation, loss, emptiness. Someone, someone will ask us if we're gonna be all right and we will tell them only if we believe it. Another will ask us if we're gonna get through this and we'll tell them that we have to want it bad enough to see it. We strain to manage this new way of learning ourselves. The day before the world tilted, I had claimed to be a lover of humankind. I touted my goodwill and arrogance about bared my self-righteousness and feel goods across my chest. And then when the world placed us in timeout, I had to prove it. Had to take only my ration from the market, check on neighbors and phone friends, press my palms against glass to see family, my hellos and goodbyes muted, my farewells and home goings silenced. I walked these streets I know like a stranger, like a soul outside of herself hold my lone woman praise and worship, be okay with passing through the same four rooms while Mahalia blankets me in song. How I got over, I've been falling and rising all these years, but you know, my soul sits back and wonder, how did we make it over? I now know that we are builders, designers, architects of our lives. We can draft an existence one day and when it's upended, erase, maintain the foundation and start over the next. We are all in our dojo of life and this world has become our sensei and we are stealth students studying this new language, this new thing, meditating and marveling, moving and mourning, marinating and musing. Each day, another chance to practice being human. Each day, another chance to learn to master ourselves. Well, I um, got me enthralled now. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, this, now, did you say you, you're having, you, um, you're going to be bringing out a book soon? 
Yeah, I'm working on a manuscript. It's not, I don't know how soon that'll be because that's not something I'm going to self-publish. I'm going to mm-hmm. seek publication mm-hmm. uh, on this one. So I'm just working on it. And it's between, you know, working full time. And I just, uh, as you said, my poet laureate tenure ended at the end of uh, end of December. So I've been, you know, I have a project I'm starting uh, with Yolanda, a project called Consensus, where we're going to be working to count, gather, and create a monument for um, representing 100 Black women poets in the city of Philadelphia. Mm. So it's a heavy part that we're having. Um, we're about to kind of let out all of the uh, marketing type information in the next couple of, I guess, month and a half, maybe. Um, so I've been working on that and um, still working on the manuscript and just another couple of other really cool projects that I'm that I'm interested in doing. Mm. And I'm still, you know, here and there doing teaching artist stuff, working with the youth and things like that. So wonderful, (laughs) man. Mm. Got a lot going on. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so how do people find out about, you know, your work and what you're doing? Um, You have a website, I know. I have a website. It's not updated yet, folks. So, you know, I... (laughs) Um, I, it will be, but I have contact information. I have a in contact information page on there. So if people have questions or want to know more or want to know what's kind of going on, uh, it, it, it will, uh, I have to update the list of happenings and things that are ha- going on, but, um, there's a contact tab on there that folks, I receive comments and questions and inquiries all the time through my, um, website. So that's where people can find out more. It's- Trapita Mason. It's just Mason.com. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, I really want to thank you so much for joining me and us. It's been fantastic. You are a real treasure. I often talk about that the Philadelphia is filled with human treasures, mm-hmm. uh, living treasures mm-hmm. here in this city. And you are certainly one of them. Um, I look forward to seeing you out and about. I was telling you that I, um, um, uh, that I was at an event and I saw Manette uh, Sudler mm-hmm. uh, not yeah. too long ago. And, there's, you know, hopefully with uh, the COVID is beginning to abate a little bit. And mm-hmm. so uh, maybe we'll be getting out more and I look forward to getting a chance to meet you in person. Yeah, and I thank you for inviting me here and um, me just even knowing more about um what you do and you know the, the uh interview and the people that you wow have been in touch with and touched so i'm honored to be here and um and um a part of this and and so it's been an absolute pleasure thank you pleasure has been mine and you can just go to my website um mm-hmm. blackrocksoul.com and mm-hmm. uh that's where our interviews are but you know you can also click on radio and hear some great music that I um, curate and have a little uh, online radio station as it were. But again, thanks so much. If you don't mind, uh, after we end this, I would like to chat with you briefly for a minute or two, so. Oh, sure. All right. Sure, I'll stay on. Okay, so everyone, mm-hmm. uh, Trapita Mason, um, Poet Laureate, Philadelphia, and look out for her. Uh, go to her website and check her out. And thanks so much for, uh, joining us everyone okay thank you